Hi, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to talk about the history of the Gagnon Somatic Reintegration Program. So how I came to develop this program has been a lifelong learning, at least 40 years, because I'm now 58. In my childhood I was always involved in gymnastics and swimming, and then around the age of 9 or 10 I dropped all of that and I went straight into dance and did some competition years and then eventually I quit and went to a different studio where we focus mostly on performance and um, learning to teach. So I taught dance as of the age of 15 and I continued to teach throughout. And then in my 20s I got involved in functional fitness and weightlifting and group fitness and all that. And then eventually I became a professional Afro-Latin dancer and that was a 10-year process. Now throughout this whole time I had all kinds of health challenges, let's say. I had various diagnoses that significantly affected my musculoskeletal system. So you can imagine, as a professional dancer, an elite athlete, pushing my body as hard as I was, I did sustain a lot of injuries. And by the age of 31, I had to quit dance full time. And that's when I retrained into yoga and into Pilates. So those were the first two major influences on the development of my methodology. Okay. When I first quit dance, I was a disaster. I could barely walk. I, I couldn't uh, stay awake longer than three hours at a time. I had to take a lot of naps. And I slowly rehabilitated my body using yoga. I did yoga, deep yoga practice every day. And what I learned from yoga is the importance of marrying your breath to your movement. So all movement should be coordinated with breath. Breath is the key to life. Breath is your first motion. Right? It's the first thing that moves your body. So from yoga, I, I learned, I very much integrated the idea that breath is a critical, important part of any exercise program and should always be coordinated with your movement. Then into Pilates. Now I taught Pilates full time for 26 years and I worked uh, in different types of environments. I had my own studio and I did a lot of post rehab work, pre and post surgery, but I also worked with elite athletes to prevent injury or to be able to train through injuries. Uh, different dancers, um, Scottish dancers, and triathletes, and things like that. So anyways, I had great success. I had a physios call and send people to me because they weren't having a lot of success with certain clients. There were certain chronic injury patterns, meaning that somebody would get injured, they'd go get physio or chiropractic or massage or something for usually, it could be anywhere from six to nine months, and then they feel well enough to start working out again. They start working out again, and in three months, they're back into an injury and then they're back into the rehab. So there was nothing in between and coming to me and working with me to, to, to kind of move between the rehab part of your exercise program back to your normal program, it, be it weightlifting or whatever it is that you did, they would come to me uh, for three to six months of doing Pilates, reintegrating functional fitness. So even though I was teaching Pilates, I always uh, taught them how to translate this information from an upright position and taught the clients how to integrate these same neuromuscular patterns when they were doing weightlifting or any other activity, playing tennis, jogging, whatever it is that they, they like to do. So Pilates taught me the importance of joint alignment and proper neuromuscular recruitment patterns, meaning that the nerves and the muscles that are firing up to create motion should be the ones that are supposed to be firing up. So if I'm doing a bicep curl, this is the bicep, right? That's a bicep curl. But sometimes you see people with patterns, like they have tense shoulders, so they might actually do the bicep curl like this. They hold this tight. Well, the upper trap does not contribute to the bicep motion, so it shouldn't be involved. So that's just a very basic example of how I teach. Only the muscles that are supposed to work, work. The rest need to relax or support, it's contract just to support. So it's a, almost like an isometric, isotonic play in the support patterns. So that was from Pilates. And once I took the breath from yoga and then the alignment and, and neuromuscular recruitment patterns that I learned in Pilates, I was achieving significant success with a lot of these people that I worked with. And so in order to understand my methodology more profoundly, I wrote a book. <laughs> when I want to understand uh, a certain maybe topic more in depth, I do the research, I write the book, and I prepare to teach it to others, even if I never teach it. It's how I learn, how I integrate the information at a deep, deep level. So I wrote this book, The JPD Method of Body Works, and it goes through all the different principles, the important part of marrying breath, 
mind and body in every single workout. Your mind shouldn't be wandering around thinking about what you're making for dinner. No, your mind should be actively engaged saying to your body, oh, we're doing a bicep curl. Therefore, you're going to keep the shoulder back in the lat, keep the upper track relaxed. Let's just isolate this one bone and do your bicep curl in wherever you want to make it happen, right? So the mind should be involved. So here's the book that I wrote in 2003. Let's take a little brief look at the table of contents. Namely, let's look at the other influences on my methodology, as well as how I synthesized these concepts into a method I called the JPD Method of Body Works back then. Let's start with Rudolf Laban. He worked in the beginning of the 20th century and was most known as a dancer, choreographer, and especially he studied human movement. He was known to develop a notation system called Laban Notation and worked through the entire human kinosphere to improve human movement for dancers and actors. So here's an example of his Laban notation system and how he used that to help people who are actors and dancers improve their stage presence. But the greatest influence on my work was Ermgard Bartiniev. She was a dancer and choreographer who studied with Rudolf Laban. She learned Laban movement analysis as well as Laban notation. She then became a physical therapist and merged these two concepts to develop some principles of motion as well as the Bartinev fundamentals that she used in physical therapy as well as dance therapy. Bartinev developed certain principles of motion after a lifelong study of physical therapy and Laban movement analysis. She believed, and I quote, sequencing and initiation, breath support, spatial intent, rotation, attitude and effort, dynamics, and themes of expression function, inner, outer, stability, mobility, exertion, recuperation. These all support the Bartinev fundamentals. Now let's look at how Pilates Yoga, Laban and Bartinev contributed to my methodology. First, we have guiding principles. We start with your belief system. What you believe, you will achieve. Good, even if it's bad. Now the second principle states that regular workouts, they work out consistently and rhythmically and regularly with visualization, that's how you achieve results. Third principle says that past physical trauma will impact motion and must be respected during the workout. Fourth principle, the flow of emotions in the human body often impacts how the muscles and the fascia contract. Finally, as you balance and align the spine and the joints, you will have better movement and overall a greater sense of wellness. So now let's look at how these guiding principles then become functional principles. How do these apply to every workout that you do? Essentially, how do you synthesize the concepts of Rudolf Laban, Ermgard Bartinev, Yoga and Pilates into one cohesive workout that produces beneficial results long term? Let's look at what I wrote in 2003. Each workout must follow the following rules. Breath moves the body. Breath coordinates with every movement. Spinal and joint alignment must be established before every single exercise, before any movement. The mind must be engaged. You have to visualize the shapes you're creating. You have to apply intention to every movement and every breath. You have to incorporate movement in all three planes of the kinesphere in each training session. Three-dimensional movement of the spine and joint is very important in the JPD method of body works as well as now the JSRP. Always concentrate on the quality of movement before you challenge strength or coordination. All training sessions must be functional. Excess tension in muscle fibers should be released as much as possible in order to access the underutilized muscle fibers. This is how we create balance. Balanced muscles pull joints into better alignment. Belief. Where the mind goes, energy follows. Therefore, everyone must believe that the work will achieve the results that are desired. While we do concentrate on quality of motion and good neuromuscular recruitment patterns, you still need to reach muscular fatigue each training session. Finally, you want to expend a minimum amount of effort to achieve a maximum amount of movement. So those were my thoughts in 2003. But I really needed to understand why it worked. And secondly, I needed to find a manual therapy process that could help people progress faster. The reason being, when the muscles came into balance and started pulling joints into alignment as my process is supposed to be doing, any fascia that was thick or tough or contractured or calcified or something would have to rip and tear. There would be a small injury that would have to be rehabbed over the course of about three months to restore normal form and function to that joint. 
And I wondered, is there a way to accelerate that process, make it easier for the client? I studied Bowen therapy, but when I found out that Tom Bowen had been an osteopath for a while before the whole regulation process came down in Australia, I went back to school in 2008 to study osteopathy. That clarified why my system works, and secondly, it also helped me to develop it more effectively so that you can do a lot of your own self-adjustments at home by adding concepts that I started using quite a lot in osteopathy, such as breath-assisted positional release, where you assume a specific position that helps to derotate a joint, a spine, anything like that, but you only use your breath to change the ligaments that hold that joint together, as well as breath-assisted activation. Meaning that if there's a muscle that's a bit too tight, you can actually do a little bit of a stretch and then use your limbs to push against something, so an isometric contraction, that helps to activate the reflex arc and therefore release excess tension of the muscle before you start to work. Here I thought, I think, I think I understand. I, I think I see how it's going to work, but what do I need to do? What is my process to make sure that I get the information clear inside this noggin so that I can translate it to somebody else? I write a book. <laughs> but no, in this case, I developed a 16-hour, four-modular course, Advanced Anatomy and Physiology for Yoga and Pilates Instructors. Because my intention was that since Pilates and Yoga has the potential to completely realign all your joints and restore all your mobility. It will only happen if it's truly done correctly and the exercises that are developed for a client respect the client's past injury history as well as past mental emotional history. So here's the course. So you can pause and read and you can see that it's a very detailed course. Not because I expected the yoga and Pilates instructor to have a medical level understanding of human physiology, but because I wanted them to have an appreciation by, of the complexity of the human's body function. And the biggest thing that I emphasized was how everything is interconnected. We talked about fascia and how diaphragm moves fluid and how everything just works together to create a holistic cohesive system and when they are putting together their programs they should respect that and not do things like hey let's do hamstring stretch class day or hey let's stretch your ligaments of your neck these are things that the body has been designed not to do not to ever isolate a muscle group or not to ever disrupt the function of ligaments on purpose because ligament laxity can create far more health problems than rigidity in the muscles so this is how I came to develop the GSRP. After about 10 years of intense osteopathic practice and putting some of these concepts to use with my clients, I truly came to understand why and how it works. That'll be in future videos. In 2020, when we got locked down, I thought this is the perfect time to start releasing my ideas that I started forming way back at the age of 19. How can exercise improve your state of health and wellness. And there you go, the history of the GSRP.